morning. Good to see everybody this morning. We're going to be singing out of the Methodist hymnal today, so if you get your hymn books out, and let's turn to hymn number 514, 514. Let's all stand as we sing, Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you into your father's house again this morning. It's good to be able to come together. It's good to uh, be in God's house this 3rd of July on this uh, grand day. If you're joining us at uh, another time, perhaps through some medium, we want to also welcome you. And we want to invite you to come and be with us here at Old Bethel, 930 on Sunday mornings. Find a home here and enjoy fellowship and worship with us. Again, welcome. Thank you, Brother Wayne. We're going to get back into our service and song again this morning, and our next hymn is America the Beautiful. Uh, it's hymn number 696. 696. <laughs>
Our next hymn is right across the page, 697, and it's called America. This time, it's time for our children's message this morning, so Miss Shelley is on her way down, so kiddos, come on down at this time. It is the 4th of July, but it has another name. Do y'all know what that other name is? Independence Day. Independence Day, and that's what we're going to talk about today, independence. Um, <clears throat> first, we're going to see what it feels like to not be free. So I want y'all to sit on your hands. Sit on your hands where you can't use them. All right. Now, I want you to scratch your nose. Okay, Brock used his knee. Gracie didn't even try. Okay. What about pat your head? Can't do that, can you? You pat your forehead on your knee, but you can't pat your head without your hand. Oh. Uh, did you like not being able to use your hands? Kind of, sure. Kind of, it was kind of, you know, different, new. But really, if this was, you know, like normal day, you couldn't play video games without your hands, could you? Couldn't ride your bike, not very well. You'd probably crash if you did. There's a lot of things you couldn't do if you couldn't use your hands, right? Well, all right. Y'all can take your hands out. Scratch your noses, pat your head. See, you can do things now. Does it feel better to have your hands free? Yeah. Well, on July the 4th, the United States celebrates Independence Day. It's the anniversary of when we adopted the Declaration of Independence in 1776. All right, sit on your hands again. 
before the declaration, the people who lived here were ruled by another country across the ocean. Now, wave your hands up in the air. Take them out and wave them up in the air. Wave them. Don't get excited. Good, Brock. Come on, Gracie. In 1776, the people said, we're free. They said, we are independent. We're our own country. But did you know that if you believe in Jesus, you have an even better Independence Day to celebrate? Second Corinthians 3.17 tells us, Now the Lord Jesus is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. When we ask Jesus to forgive the bad things we've done, Jesus forgives us. We're free of those sins. So when you see flags or fireworks or parades or any of the stuff that you see around to celebrate Independence Day, remember that Independence Day as a country is a great thing, but also remember that your independence from sin because of Jesus is even greater. And I brought a little something. Now what's that, Brock? Look at the front. A flag. What's it the flag of? A flag, the flag of America. And it symbolizes our freedom as a nation or our independence from England. Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you so much for our freedom both our freedom through your Son, Jesus Christ, and the freedom of our nation. Turn our nation back to you and help us all to celebrate the wonderful freedom that you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. At this time, for ushers will come or receive this morning's offering.
me a favor, remain standing, and we're going to sing our praise song this morning. It's uh, going to be on the overhead, and it's God Bless America. So hopefully you'll stand on this song right here, God Bless America. be seated. This time we're going to turn it over to Brother Wayne uh, for this morning's message. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be looking at Luke's Gospel, 10th chapter. We're going to look at the first 20 verses. When I was much, much younger, when I was a child growing up, you would hear the preacher say uh, things about the unforgivable sin, and they, you know, he'd throw it out in the middle of something, and then he wouldn't tell you what it was. And you know, as a child, that that frightened me. Oh my goodness! What you know, you don't know what it is. What if you do it and you don't know it, and then you're you're just done. You're ruined. Well, then later, you coming along trying to mind your own business and you're at church somewhere and the preacher throws out that, well, you know, the unforgivable sin, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Boy, that narrows it down really good for somebody that's not educated in theological circles. So not only is there this sin that's unforgivable, but it's doing something that didn't have any idea what it meant. What does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What's the best thing about being free? You don't have to go through a harsh living. You don't have to. There's a key phrase, Brock. And that's really, really good. You don't have to. Because we're free. We get to choose. What in the world does that have to do with the unpardonable sin? What does it have to do with blaspheming? What is blaspheming the Holy Spirit? You know, as you grow and you get a little older, then you'll finally hear somebody else say, well, you know, that's, taking the Lord's name in vain. Again, that, okay, what, what, what does that mean? Well, you know, that's cursing and in, interjecting the name of God in there. Well, that satisfies a lot of people, and, and it makes it really easy not to blaspheme the Holy Spirit, really easy not to uh, 
commit the unpardonable sin. Just don't curse, you know, with God in the formula. Well, some problems with that. Number one, God's name is not pronounceable. Do you, I hope you've learned that. Uh, now, we're living in a time and have lived in a time where people pronounce all kind of words and say, you know, that's God's name. This is God's name. That's God's name. These people use that name. These people that name. The believers, God's chosen, purposely pinned a name for God that was absolutely not pronounceable because they felt like if you said that name, you would die. Well, we, we fixed that for them. We stuck some vowels in there and now we can say it. We had people willing to give their life so that you could be here today or so that you didn't have to. You could choose not to be here. I would offer you that blaspheming the Holy Spirit is wasting. It, it literally is taking the Lord's name in vain. You run around telling people, even yourself, that you are a Christian when you are no such thing. Now, in this country, you're free to do that. Understand that. But it comes at a price. And we are, perhaps more than any other time in, in recent history, thinking about history of the world, history of humanity, probably more than any other time, we are living in a time that that's rampant. We want to rewrite scripture. We want to rewrite anything that's not popular or comfortable for us. The lectionary reading today was verses 1 through 12 and then it jumped to 16. It left out 13 through 15. So I'm going to read today's lectionary reading. I'm going to read it from a New International Version of the Bible. Would you please stand for the reading of the gospel? Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 12 and 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them the harvest is plentiful but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet, we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. I, excuse me, have it. Now let's jump over to 16. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me, but he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. I shouldn't even have read that. I should have read 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice 
that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Now, you can see it. You've been standing a while. I want to back up now, and I want to read to you. you you've just heard. I want, you know, he's chosen these 72, and he sent them out, and he's told them. Very frankly, I'm sending you out among wolves. Um, but don't worry. Don't make any special preparations. Don't take a purse or a bag or a sandals. And this is important. Don't visit along the way. You've been sent on a task. Attend to your task. Don't greet people on the road. When you get to a place, go to a house. Uh, when they greet you, say peace upon this house. If they're peaceful people, it will rest on them. If not, they'll throw it back in your face. Stay in that house that's peaceful, eating and drinking whatever they give you. If you enter a town and you're welcomed, that's great. But if you go there and they reject you, be sure and tell them that uh, I shake the dust from my feet. We don't really understand that, but see, if they had received them, they would have washed their feet, wouldn't have any dust on them. Shake the dust from your feet and tell them. Tell them. The kingdom of God is near. The kingdom of God is near. Now let's hear the rest of what he said. You know, they came back and they said, Whoa, you wouldn't believe it. Even the demons obeyed us. He said, Oh yeah, I, I knew it. I I knew beforehand what would happen. But don't get so wound up in the fact that demons obeyed you. Don't be surprised about the power that I've granted you and that you've received and used. Be thankful and overjoyed that your name is written in the book of life, that you are going to your reward. That's a wonderful scripture. It's good to hear right before the... 4th of July and it's comfortable it fits in with our air conditioning and our carpet and our padded pews but we've left out something what did we leave out woe to you let me back up to 12 I tell you it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town that's the town that rejects them. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be lifted up to the skies? No. You will go down to the depths. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. We don't like the woe. Whoever decided, whoever sat down and decided the common lectionary for the church, that is for the world, that's not for the United Methodist Church or this church, said, let's just cut out those woes. We talked about something that was left out in Sunday school that was striking, that was remarkable last Sunday. Had you been there, you would have known it. If you want to find out what it was, you need to stay for Sunday school. See what you missed? Let's just leave that part out. Let's just leave that out. Let's just decide, since we are so powerful, what's right and what's wrong. Let's decide what's in and what's out. Let's make everything really smooth and nice. I promise you that attendance at this church was much better when they didn't have air conditioning. I promise you it was much better when they didn't have padded pews or carpet. When in the summer you had to fight the wasp, to survive a service. See, I grew up in a church just about this size 
just about this far out in the country. I know something of that. Young people don't. They've never known anything but this. They think this is the way it should be. My friends, there is a truth. And it is the only thing that will set you free. Dulling a knife doesn't make the wound any less deadly. Matter of fact, dulling the knife makes it worse. But it sounds good. Oh, that knife is so sharp. Let's just dull those knives. No. No, let's learn to respect that edge for what it is. It's deadly. My friends, sin is deadly. We're living in a time where the church is deciding. They've de- taken it upon themselves to decide where God messed up and where he didn't, what is right and what is wrong. In our United Methodist Church, not in this conference, thank uh, God for that at this time, but in other conferences, they have ordained, they have placed the full authority of the church upon professing, practicing homosexuals. The Bible, the Word of God, says that that is an abomination. It is unnatural. It is against nature. Now the thing that bothers me that that has just worried me all the week is, where's our bishop on that? He's supposed to sort of speak, sort of represent us. Well, he's on leave, extended leave in back at his home in Georgia. I guess they don't have phones or text or email or anything over there, so he can't speak to that. Where is our cabinet in his absence, the assistant to the bishop? Where is the uproar? You see, we are, as United Methodists are connectional. You don't know what that means. That's preacher's fault. It means that we're all connected. If you're a Methodist, you should be able to go to any United Methodist church anywhere in the world and say, I need some help and receive it. Because we're all connected in this ministry of Jesus the Christ. That's the good part. The bad part is we've now been connected to an abomination. And it's not a new thing. We have allowed our churches to be connected to sin more profusely and more profusely. We kind of have the don't ask, don't tell. We no longer call people to repent. We no longer call people to surrender. We no longer call people out of sin. We try to make them comfortable in their sin. When I was in my undergrad, I got my undergrad in psychology and in child psychology, we, uh, I had the head of the department was teaching that course and uh, you really had to be there to appreciate it. I was quite a bit older than most of the students there and uh, had four sons at the time and were trying to juggle pastoring the church, getting a college degree and uh, raising, helping raise four sons and the professor said one day that corporal punishment has a place in the rearing of children and he said and at the time and the place that you should use it it should be so severe to be considered child abuse he said if your child is playing in the road or on the railroad tracks or playing encountering, involved in anything that is deadly. Corporal punishment needs to be immediate and so severe that that child will never, ever even think about engaging in that again. But that's so harsh. That's just not kind. It's not real kind to let your child die either. 
God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's John 3, 17. If you continue, continue reading into 18, it says because the world already stands condemned. You see, there's this little thing that I was uh, chastised about when I came up for ordination called original sin. One of the questions that as a United Methodist pastor up for ordination as an elder that you have to answer is, what do you see is, a, is a, uh, the biggest and the largest impediment towards the ministry today? And in mine, I said, we um, seem to have lost the understanding of total depravity. Oh, that's Calvinist. Oh. As they were trying to rake me over the coals. But one thing about being free, Brock, is you don't have to let people rake you over the coals because we belong to God. And the truth, the truth really sets us free. When they all finally kind of quieted down, I said, I rest my case. You go into a church and you see when you go up for ordination as an elder, you've already had several years pastoring churches. I said, the biggest problem with United Methodists, with the church, with Christians today is they just can't believe that God wouldn't be glad to have them. They're good people. They don't really need forgiveness. They just need acceptance. As United Methodists, we believe in original sin, which means when you were born, that beautiful child back there is sinful. I always tell people, now if you don't believe that, Get six two-year-olds who've never seen each other, so they don't have any, you know, oh, oh, I've been wanting to get my teeth in that young and for a year syndrome. They've never seen each other. Put them in a room and just leave them alone. It won't be long. You will witness uh, original sin. Somebody will pull hair, bite, pinch, claw, hit, knock down, hold, take away. It will happen. It's in us. We don't have to learn it. It's already in us. It doesn't matter that you've never murdered anyone or stolen anything. You need forgiveness. And the fact that we would, rather than call people out of a life of sin into a life of truth, we would leave them chained and shackled to death makes my case. We have forgotten who we are. We have forgotten who God is. And we've written a new story that's really comfortable. It makes us feel good, but it leaves people chained to sin and death. I was speaking with my son yesterday about this terrible accident. He went to school with a young lady who was driving, and I said, you know, she really needs to talk to someone who's competent to help her deal with this. If not, it'll, it'll ruin her life. Uh, accidents are accidents. But you see, we always want to assign blame and we want to keep people tied to that blame, chained to that blame, because then we can control them. We can keep them in their place. But Brock, the, the, the good news about being a Christian and believing in Jesus is he's coming to our heart and set us free. We don't have to do that. We can say, I'm covered by the blood. Am I perfect? Absolutely not. Will I ever sin again? I most absolutely will. But when I stand in judgment, the thing that's going to make the difference as I stand there is not when he opens that book, let me see Oh, you were pretty bad to, oh yeah, right here you accepted me and from there on it's great. No. He's going to open that book and go, I'm glad you belong to me. Because that's the only way that you're going to come in. The only way. But you see, if we can remind people and keep them tied to their sin, we can make them really comfortable. We're going to have cushions and air and carpet. We're going to smile and greet them, but we're going to keep them tied in that sin so that they have no life, no hope, no peace, no joy. 
And that's not what God sent his son for. And my friends, if you have decided that you don't need to share the truth, then you don't have the truth. Woe unto you. I know you don't like that word. I know it's not comfortable. I don't like it either. Woe unto you. Because if you have Jesus, you will share Jesus. If you're not sharing Jesus, I got bad news. Woe unto you. You don't have him. You don't have him. You may know about him. You may know his name. You may tell people that you've got him. But that's something you can't keep in. And my friends, that's blaspheming the Holy Spirit. God can't forgive you for something that you say you don't need forgiveness for. It's not that God's not powerful and capable, but you've said, oh, I've already got it. I don't need it. I'm good. Uh, These other folks over here, there's some junkies and there's some some here, there, and there. You need to, to, I'm, I'm okay. You need to go deal with them. God will honor your wishes and you'll never have life. You'll never know peace and joy. You'll just kind of have existence until you have nothing but hell. That's a good thing about being a preacher. You can say hell without getting a whipping. But it's not good for our people if they don't hear woe. Woe unto you. Woe unto you. You have not because you ask not when you ask. You ask for the wrong things. You need Jesus. My friend, Brother Tony MacDonald, we rode to school back and forth. We were both preachers trying to juggle the same things. And he'd come out of a Baptist, really Baptist. And that was his answer to everything. You need Jesus. He's exactly right. He was, and he is exactly right. Nothing else is going to work. The young lady, what she needs to hear that was in this accident is that it was an accident. There's no blame. There's no guilt. Now, if it wasn't an accident, that's something different. But unless you intend something, then it's an accident. Was it preventable? Sure. Still an accident. Blame and guilt don't come from God. They come from the devil. They come from us. What she needs to hear is that God forgives you and I forgive you. That's not who you are. That's something that happened. Whatever sin you've got in your life does not define you. God defines you. You belong to him. And my friends, that will set you free. If you've never known the love of God, if you've never surrendered your heart and your life, you can't have it both ways. You absolutely cannot straddle a fence. I, you know, I grew up with cattle and barbed wire. You learn that really quick. That doesn't work. Folks that always lived in town, I don't know how they learned that. It doesn't work. You can either have God and have life Or you can reject God and have death. It's your choice. But if you've never done that, you can't get in on your friends' say so. You can't get in on your parents' lives. You can't get in on anything except your surrender. We baptize infants in the United Methodist Church. And I'm for that a million percent. If you've never understood that, the onus is on you. We charge you, you make a vow before God Almighty to so live your life and guide the life of that child, that infant, so that they will naturally, normally accept Christ for themselves. Now, if you were baptized as an infant, that's great, that's wonderful, but you still have to make that final surrender. The church can live perfectly before you. 
The church can guide your life perfectly. But that day has to come when you yourself say, I want Jesus in my heart, in my life. If you've never done that, I don't care if you're 2, 3, 10, 15, 80. I'd be scared to death to leave here. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, your life can be over. We could exhaust the day with examples. I, I cannot stop thinking about this young girl that just on the way home, just the other child just riding a bicycle. Summer day, out of school. It's gone. Do you know Jesus as Lord and Savior of your life? Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for this church, for the gospel, the truth, the way, and the life. I pray that you would send your spirit upon us, into us, to the point that any kind of doubt, any kind of fear, any kind of courage that we might need would be there. That we could overcome every obstacle and come to you and know true life, true freedom, and true peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's take our hymn books and turn to 569. Five sixty nine. As we sing, if you need to make a decision, please choose God. If you need to surrender, please do that. If you'd like someone to pray with you, if you'll r raise your hand, some of us will. If you'd like to come and pray, please come. If you don't raise your hand, we're not going to bother you. We're, we're, not, we're not here to put you on the spot. We're here trying to get home just like you are. Please come as we sing. 569. Go in peace may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit go with you always. Amen.